Hi, and welcome to the Pacific Center podcast. I'm Dr. East, and I'm here with a legend, Dr. Jeremy Pulsifer, one of my favorite people in our profession and po possibly even the planet, is here to talk a little bit about what he is going to present at the upcoming Pacific Symposium. And if you know me by now, we're going to talk about a little bit more. Welcome, Jeremy. I'm so happy to see you. How are you doing right now? Thank you, Dr. East. I'm doing wonderfully, and I am endlessly enthused about being able to be talking with you today about such a wide range of fascinating subjects. Thank you for inviting me here. Yes, yes. Well, I was thrilled. So um, I want to start with your presenting on Thursday, November the 3rd, 2022 at Pacific Symposium. You're going to present in the morning and you're going to present in the afternoon. The morning topic reads biophysics and acupuncture, the convergence of Eastern and Western understanding. Can you give us a little sample of what that talk's going to be on? Yeah, it's it's such a far reaching set of disciplines and topics, but if I were to give it nomenclature and to assign a central value to it, we might call it the field, examining electricity, magnetism, and the physics of light. And, and that might just be to properly frame our consciousness in a series of ideas that, that will be discussed, but underneath it, right, in, in the subtextual realm and in all of the spaciousness that surrounds this, we're really talking about the all that is. And to give that greater definition, what uh, Michael Talbot wrote about in the holographic universe, what Lynn McTaggart um, recently popularized with her book, The Field, and of course, referencing the book Energy Medicine by Dr. Jill Blakeway, we're really talking about the force of the universe or the multiverse, which is probably more correctly framing it, and how this is coming into the forefront of not just the layperson's consciousness, but the world at large, and no better time than right now here in the year 2022, that everything is united at its point of essence, we are all one, and that every part of time and space is inherently and instantaneously informed by all other locations. And there's so oh much goodness. that we could, we could talk about with regards to that. But I feel like this is the part that makes our profession passionate, right? Dipping into the invisible or the interior or into the interstices that lies between all matter. And quite honestly, far from being a far-flung fancy of imaginative indulgence, this is the ground being of physics, both early and modern. If we c connect this to the classics or do a Chinese medicine, Eastern philosophy overlay, are we talking about the 10,000 things? Yes. In fact, there's so many ways in which I want to enter into this subject, right? When, when we talk about the, the all that is and, and the, the mystery and the unwavering and ever expanding Tao, right? At its first cleavage and division into yin and yang, into dynamism and magnetism, that there are even further divisions that come forth from this, right? Into the, the five phases, the wu xin, right? And then we get into the elements. And this idea that's woven through the conference that's coming up um, at the beginning of November, which we're all so excited about, is there's a lot of discussion with all of the speakers this year about resonance, especially derivative of the classical text and the origin of our medicine, right? So then when we move into the five phases that under the banner of the element of fire are all these, these points and these issues that resonate with fire, such as the direction of south, the element of fire, the organ of the heart, and the, the pericardium or the heart protector, and that that has to do with circulation and the expression of joy, and if pathologic, then perhaps mania, and connectivity of the spirit that allows your luminous presence to unite with others, bringing that precious element of the Shen into its destiny to have communion 
again, with all that is by having that presence in the manifold things, that is really important for us to understand and to examine that nature has set up union under certain overarching qualities. And that if we tap into those conglomerations, into those affinities, we have much more ability to influence, to heal, to modulate when we focus in on that which is foundational. And if I'm going to speak to something in the realm of physics or in the universe that's tangible, when we look at the sun itself, Right? This is so fascinating that you and I and everything in this physical realm is born of elements that were cooked in the belly of our star. This is one of my favorite images, right? That all matter that we are currently embodying, living through, that us as the witness of life in our unified consciousness are perceiving was born in the center of our star. And so everything, even within the solar system, and namely on the terrestrial sphere of planet Earth, is united outside of time and space. That even though it's 93 million miles away, that when the sun goes through a tremendous outgassing or coronal mass ejection, or say a flare, that all radioactive material on the surface of the Earth and within the Earth changes its rate of decay at the instant that the sun goes through that energetic spasticity, right? That there is no physical space in that everything has that connectivity. We call that supraluminal theory above the speed of light. And so when people make these proclamations like we are all one, the all is connected, everything is effortlessly unfolding through proper flow, under the great aegis of the Tao. On the level of physics, that is already established. I love it. Oh my goodness. I don't know how you're gonna fit this into an hour in the morning. I know that you have been a professor at the New York campus for Pacific College teaching biological aspects of physics for a number of years. Is that correct? Yeah. I've been teaching since around the year, I believe, 2009, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was about 40 consecutive semesters of teaching the biological aspects of physics. Wow, wow. And then also a supervisor at the clinic on yes. the New York campus for 13 years. For 13 years, I've been supervising on the ground and, and teaching subjects relatable to this, and also um, very specifically, besides herbal medicine and classical channel theory and TCM channel theory, I really zero in on electricity and magnetism. So naturally, I cleaved to electroacupuncture. And one thing that we're interested in, in bringing early in the education of the students in um, the New York City campus is the endogenous opioid system and the relationship of how electricity stimulates it. And, and why we want to talk about the endogenous opioid system is because it, upon a cursory or superficial glance, people will look at that and say, oh, that's for pain. That's to regulate and neuromodulate nociception. And one of the things about the endogenous opioid system, particularly the mu receptors, which are very much uh, have an affinity for what we call beta endorphin and enkephalin. Um, and if you use a certain frequency, right, that you create two waveforms per second with your electrostim device, that area of the brain, the mu receptors, really turns on. And the thing for both us and for the patients to understand is that those endogenous opioid receptors also regulate stress temperature, the respiration, the endocrine system, the gastrointestinal system, our memory function, our mood, and our motivation. So when we talk about a very primordial objective in acupuncture to take us from sympathetic fight or flight, right, which is basically everyone in New York and probably the world <laughs> at this point, and bring them into this gorgeous bliss unspeakable 
of parasympathetic rest and digest that we're super regulating all of these systems in the body through the electro acupuncture's propagation of nerve symbol signals all the way up to the hypothalamic pituitary center where a lot of this um, region of the brain is essentially working like a gigantic endogenous morphine center. And so when we use electroacupuncture, we're immediately activating this area of nerve cells, what we call the suprachiasmatic nuclei, just north of the hypothalamus in the pituitary. And why is that important in something like um, reproductive medicine? Well, the pituitary gland is involved in signaling to the ovaries, to the gonads, right? To the testes. And so if the very mechanism of how acupuncture is activating is stimulating to the reproductive centers because the pituitary is involved in both, the applications are endless and quite powerful. What I'm hearing you say is acupuncture and electroacupuncture isn't just for pain. It can almost treat the 10,000 things. And you're segueing beautifully into your afternoon discussion, which is a three hour deep dive into electroacupuncture for reproductive medicine. I know you have a lot of experience here with your work at the Yin Ova Center. Uh, you are the reproductive medicine educational mentor there and have been for a number of years. So can you talk a little bit about, since we've kind of gone there just organically, what you're going to discuss in the three-hour module um, still on November 3rd at Symposium, where you're going to talk more about using electroacupuncture and reproductive medicine. Yes, I'll, I'll try to give you a, a cursory, succinct, and cogent overview of some of the, the main themes that we're going to be discussing. And, and one thing that I want to emphasize is manual acupuncture and all of the modalities that have we've been working through the last several thousand years have great aptitude and, and efficacy just as they are. But in instances where there could be certain patterns of disharmony, such as uh, severe blood stasis, or perhaps a preponderance or proliferation of damp phlegm, um, the idea of adding in stimulation to certain um, very strategically located acupuncture points can really optimize outcomes. So for example, when we're working in assisted reproductive technology in particular, which is quite a powerful um, you know, series of stimulations unto themselves pharmacologically, we're talking about during the follicular phase when follicles are developing in the ovaries. If oxygen rich blood, and if we wanted to get technical, the, the pulsatility index of the ovarian region of the artery is not suffusing. If oxygen rich blood isn't getting into those areas to help optimize energy demand for the growth of those follicles to grow as a cohort, to reach a certain size and dimension where the forthcoming retrieval can be fortuitous, then that might not develop in the way that we wish. And so what I've seen empirically is if we're using acupuncture and there's been several IVF cycles where follicular development um, hadn't been as we had hoped, what I've noticed empirically time and time again is a tremendous increase in the amount of follicles that grow. And more importantly, that they're all growing in tandem to where the retrievals are extraordinary in numbers that we don't anticipate. And sometimes reproductive endocrinologists will re reference that back to us through the patient. Sometimes we'll speak with them directly, but the patients themselves are like, I'm astonished in this fourth cycle that there was such a burgeoning of growth unlike any preceding cycle. And I'm going to try to take the yoke of, of power off of electroacupuncture and bring it back humbly as a mere instrument of all of this to acupuncture increases mm -hmm. blood flow to many areas. It moves the chi, it invigorates the blood. And so that's the nature of acupuncture to do that. Electroacupuncture is 
heightening that capacity, right? Hundreds of years ago, it was Wang Ching Ren in the Correcting the Errors in the Forest of Medicine, one of the classics, who said, blood stasis is one of the most important pathologies or patterns for us to examine after he had exhumed so many cadavers and did anatomical dissections and remapped the heart and the lungs. He's like, oxygenated blood must be moving. If right to quote the ancient epithet, if blood is not moving, blood is not functioning, right? If the yang is devitalized, there is no circulation. So we're coming back down to the essence, truth of why this is important. And there's many research articles, which I'm hoping to, again, distribute at the conference about the increase of endometrial receptivity from electroacupuncture, um, which is quite markedly improved in, in mm -hmm. trial after trial. So we want to bring forth the evidence base of where that's been examined and demonstrated rather than just experts reporting from clinics, but rather, you know, stringent, robust research has borne the same results. Yeah, yeah. I myself had the same experience. I did five IVFs. The first IVF was no, very little acupuncture and definitely no electroacupuncture. Then I became aggressive twice a week acupuncture my egg counts improved, but it was when we added electroacupuncture to every session that my egg qualities, uh, egg quality improved. But like you said, the IVF retrievals were just astounding. And the only thing that changed was adding the acupuncture with e-stim. I have a question. What about the effects on mitochondria? I know there are some speakers that are going to talk about that. Gabriel's going to talk about the mitochondrial fact of our medicine. Do you get into that at all with you know, Eastim and the studies? I'd like to quote a couple of, of experts in this realm from what, what I've heard and what I've learned along the way for so many people have influenced me. But firstly, I'd like to say I had the blessing and the benefit of listening many times to your friend and colleague, Drew Pearson, um, talk about this in his podcast on PEMF. And that was so captivating. And the thing that really grabbed me there was when the, he was talking about how we can increase ATP synthesis so that the mitochondria, the power factories of the cells have the capacity to run through more energy demand. Something I'd like to talk about with microcurrent, re re relatable and under, again, the heading of electroacupuncture, there are many studies that have shown both microcurrent and millicurrent um, help the mitochondria increase ATP synthesis um, 500% within the mitochondria. And so I want to reference someone in San Diego who I've had so many of us here in the East have had great fortune to study with him online, Dr. Michael Corradino. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he writes in his book, Neuropuncture, um, and in his lectures that he gives on Lauren's site, Healthy Seminars, which I highly recommend, about how stimming the point Sanyin Zhao, spleen six, the great three yin intersection, which some people poetically and beautifully references the three sisters, that using electroacupuncture in the millicurrent amperage at the frequency of two hertz, stimming spleen six also achieves that activation of the mitochondria by heightening the processing of ATP. And so that particular system is thought to bolster energy in the body and defeat fatigue and even help cellular metabolism in people with metabolic dis disorders, such as syndrome X and diabetes mellitus. So right when Drew was speaking to that with you, I said, ah, this is referencing all these other studies and examples from, from teachers and researchers about how electroacupuncture works in that system. And microcurrent in particular, I think because it's so soft, and this was something Drew spoke to about how in PEMF, right, we're working indirectly to use magnetism to induce the circuit flow in the meridians that need it. Like it outlines where the deficiencies were and then goes in surgically 
and enhances that. And when Drew was speaking, it really spoke to me because when we go in with acupuncture and electroacupuncture, right, there's a part of homeostasis where we want the body's innate intelligence to go in and augment what is in shortfall and diminish that which is super abundant. And so when we go in with an electrical circuit, it can be very right, much you're putting that on in a very particular way. And to be more elegant and poetic, microcurrent, right, coming in at 1,000 times less that amperage, that current, gently is tickling and suggesting and nudging the kayak to align in the great flow of the Meridian River without being sort of hammered over the head. And so using those softer modalities which are by no means, when I say softer, less powerful. They're equally, and in some ways, even are superordinate to it in the effectiveness of treatment. You can create that increase in power. So sometimes less is more, right? My, my colleague, um, Jeremy Steiner, who's in Montclair, New Jersey, and teaches online with electroacupuncture medicine, talks about this in, in great detail that when people are in tremendous pain, using just the greatest suggestion of inputting, like really low intensity can really optimize results. Because when the body's in an alarm state, one thing it doesn't need is for people to scream the barn is on fire, right? <laughs> Sometimes coming in subtly has the most gorgeous outcome. And so to speak and to rap about what you're saying about ATP, um, I really, and the mitochondrial machinery of, of the intracellular space, sometimes that softness is really how we engineer power. Would you equate red light therapy to the microcurrent in terms of what it's doing to mitochondrial health and oh, boosting I, it up? I think that all of these modalities fall under this banner. You know, as you're speaking to me, in addition to red light and Saluma red light therapy, I, I immediately envision this wondrous speaker, I, Dr. Dilbert, um, mm. who talks about, he speaks at symposium often about low intensity laser therapy and cold laser therapy and lasers at like 792 nanometers and, and other, freak, other wavelengths essentially. Um, that I believe that low intensity laser therapy and, and all of its variants and red light therapy and microcurrent are all touching and tickling a similar system. Mm -hmm. And where I want to jump from here with this is we're really talking about the totality of the body, its, its ability to have a completion in its communicative array. And so yin and yang in the body, every physical space in the body has an underpinning, has an integumentary system, an endoskeleton that's become very high fashion for the last 15 years or more, which is the fascial system, the connective tissue, the collagen that is in the body. And, and that this endoskeleton, this you know, repeating array of um, proline, hydroxyproline, and these, these other sort of random amino acids that create the 12 different types of collagenous connective tissue in the body and the fascial planes in the macro structure, that's not just covering every bone, every muscle, every visceral space. That on the microscopic level, the, the fibrils, the fibrils and the the, the actual microscopic level of the collagen is interdigitating with the DNA of every cell. Collagen on the level of, of the fibers and the fibrils is puncturing the phospholipid bilayer of every cell and it's going through the nuclear membrane and touching the DNA of every cell in the body. So mechanical information creates an endlessly repeating and vibratory stream of information that when I move my pinky ever so slightly, every other cell in my body is getting a mechanical framework or hologram of what's happening. And so the yin, right, the substance of the body touches everywhere. And then at the level of the DNA, there's a yang 
right? There is a light, there is a biophotonic energetic emitting. And so the light of the body, if you want to call it the chi of the body, the orgone, the prana, the ruach, whatever the titling has been, there is a life force, an elan vital, that is also transmitting as energy, right? As information. And the yin and the yang of the body, right? The yang is responsible for commanding the blood and the blood is giving birth or mothering the chi. The yin becomes the fascial network, the yang, the light of the body becomes the yang expression. And the common denominator between the yin and the yang that I'm putting here is that it's all being emitted from the DNA of every cell. And if you wanna jump that now to the macro structure of the universe, before the universe was born, there was a yin scaffolding of dark matter that networked and formed an outcropping throughout all of what we call space. And at that key moment, when the light turned on, when gravity switched on and the universe was born, the yang sprung forth from the yin. And I, I want to draw that parallel between the macro structure of the birth and sustenance of the universe with our own bodies, because we are more than our DNA, than our thoughts, than our physical vehicle. We are the witness of life, living through in these unique nodal points of individuality, experiencing the universe itself. Why wouldn't the macrocosm be repeated in the micro? Of course it would be. And we that's what we study in Chinese medicine, the microcosm within the macrocosm, as in heaven, as in below. Um, this I'm I was just so captivated by what you just said. And I know that what you were just discussing is more centered around your morning discussion. Mm -hmm. The afternoon discussion being on electroacupuncture and reproductive medicine. I have a question about that, and that is. Uh, somebody that comes to that three hour workshop with you, are they going to go home with protocols they can use to increase their own efficacy and practice uh, in the field of reproductive medicine? Um, or do you discuss herbs in that as well? I'm just wanting to give them a little bit more info on what they'll be able to take away from the three hour talk at symposium as well. Oh, I'm delighted to enumerate all the detailing there. This is going to be a discussion, not just of electroacupuncture systems that can be applied directly to specific cases, but we're even going to begin with channel theory. And we're going to, you know, very briefly as an overview, discuss Chong Mai and Ren Mai and, and really try to bring us back to the, to the root and to the origin and to the elegance of the foundation of how we're working. And then within those systems of channel theory and the secondary or complement vessels, that may be involved in these treatments. We're gonna talk about certain case presentations about challenges that we might find in working in fertility and reproductive medicine. How do we surmount those challenges, right? How might we diagnose what's going on, not just so that we can arrive at a proper diagnosis, but also so we can understand if it's blood stasis or if it's damp phlegm and spleen vacuity, then we might wanna use this technique. And if the person has an extraordinary deficiency or blood or yin vacuity, maybe instead we want to hold off on the stronger intervention and maybe resort to moxibustion or to um, more delicate strengthening techniques or tonification techniques. So it's not going to be just one size fits all, but it's going to be about being able to discern who is the unique individual before me? How do I determine what the best course of action is for these particular objectives, right? The person's um, going for an IVF transfer, they're doing IUI, they're trying to conceive naturally, they've had a series of, of miscarriages perhaps, how do we come back in with the supportive care of herbs and acupuncture to refurbish and strengthen both the psyche and the physical vessel before we move forward? So it's going to be very labor intensive and showing you not just ways in which to increase your clinical outcomes, but in how to 
witness the environment and care for and support the individual in your viewfinder under your care so that proper strategies can be used. And I, I hope that I've elucidated exactly yes. what will be in that particular setting. People will be leaving there with acupuncture point combinations that fall under their proper patterns and how to optimize that with electroacupuncture when a certain outcome hasn't been attained. Here's a way that we can perhaps transform and transmute successive outcomes with a great degree of confidence. And of course, using any research or clinical examples to support the claims of how to achieve those results. I love it. If, if anybody listening does any fertility in their practice, this is a must attend, I, I would feel. And I, you remind me a lot of Alex Tiberi in that he was one of my professors and I literally would listen to Alex Tiberi teach on anything because, <laughs> you know, so even if you're not in reproductive medicine or doing a whole lot of fertility, I feel very strongly that attending your afternoon workshop will give so many pearls for practice and successful practice because there's an overlay. When you're working with reproductive medicine, you can overlay a lot of the concepts you're gonna share with overall medicine and well being because I'm pretty sure you're gonna weave in the field and the 10,000 things and the holographic nature of life and the uh, microcosm of the macrocosm. So I wanna encourage anybody listening to this to come see you on Thursday, November 3rd at Symposium. And I know it's not stopping there. You and I spoke before we started the podcast that you're getting more into sharing this wisdom with the world. Can you tell me a little bit about that? You mentioned Tel Aviv and possibly taking some of this information worldwide. Yeah, I've been pretty much localized to New York City for, for the last 22 years as both a student um, and as somebody who's taught and, and worked as a supervisor and worked in some fairly busy clinics here in Manhattan. And it feels like at this time, it's, it's a good opportunity for me to take the experience of teaching various aspects of the medicine in a, in a port city like New York, where, right, as Paul Unschuld would say from the book Medicine in China and the medicine of systematic correspondence that he describes that in every region of the world where the medicine is allowed to incubate and cross pollinate, right? Especially in, in cities all over Eastern Asia, but also in places like San Diego, Los Angeles, New York City, where there's massive populations and there's all these people worldwide co-mingling and sharing and the medicine evolves even further. It feels like that's incubated long enough that whatever's been happening here in the Eastern seaboard, it might be time to share that unique perspective of what's developed with everybody working communally here. And so in addition to wanting to begin the drafts of a book on channel theory and point combinations and, and various disciplines where we've put forth different treatments, measured their outcomes, and then evolved treatments both at the Pacific um, Clinic and, and elsewhere, there are conferences that are coming in the future through um, some friends of mine that I've met in the Tel Aviv community, and they've encouraged us to bring that information and to share what's happening here and both the Eastern seaboard in the United States. And of course, all of our work that we do with our beloved friends on the West Coast, right, which has given birth to us here in the New York in a way. Um, <laughs> We're very excited to share that with the world. And so I'm in a preliminary talks with a friend who's studying in Tel Aviv to attend and bring the information that we're presenting in San Diego to Tel Aviv, hopefully in the spring of 2023. It's a possibility. We'll see how the world is running at that point. But it's certainly there's a need to take what's happened at all the work that, that Jillian Blakeway has put together at the UNOVA Center and that I've done with the work helping to support people educationally there and say, this is what we've been doing here and this is what's been of great success. How can we then help inform the planet? Like New York has a unique set of pressures that it puts us under, but under great pressure, wondrous gemstones are born and birthed. What can we take from the richness of those experiences and share with all of our, our sisters and brothers and humankind that we 
want to share in terms of where have we arrived now? How can we help everyone learn more about what happened here, right? All these things that happened in the last two and three quarter years that have been supreme challenges and heartbreaks. What did we learn along the way? What was the jewel box of those experiences, of those sorrows that can now bring joy and reharmonization to a world in dire need? And so those are some of the projects that we have on the burners. Um, you know, even doing our work with all the centers we have at UNOVA, there will be coming a time perhaps where that will expand further and we're trying to help enrich the education of that development. You know, Manhattan has been a unique location on the planet for reproductive medicine and reproductive endocrinology because of the tendency for people to fly in to work with all these specialists, um, many of whom are on the east side of, of New York City and Manhattan. And so there's this sort of unique opportunity of working with those reproductive endocrinologists. What have we learned under those particular circumstances and how can we share that with others? And I think that's the mission is, you know, supporting our patients, but then supporting the community and our consciousness at large in the end. I love it. It's, it's sharing that. One thing that occurred to me was like the four minute mile. As you go and share your successes, you're also sharing what's possible with the world, just like the four minute mile. For many years, it was believed it wasn't possible. One person broke the four minute mile, then all of a sudden, hundreds of people were breaking the four minute mile. With you and your mission being out there, people are going to start to see that so many things are possible with fertility. Do you have any good, any other stories around um, maybe your work at Yanova or in fertility? Um, I know you do. You are such an amazing storyteller. I don't know if you can share one success that comes to your mind. You know, one thing that I'd, I'd like to point to, I can kind of wed two regions of our discussion into one outcropping. You know, I think that we're at a point now where the history of human consciousness is about to make a absolutely stratospheric and prodigious leap into a whole new realm of being. And, and again, I'm, I'm referencing the recent podcast where you and Drew were speaking, um, which, which I won't get into as much here, but I, you're gonna know that it's relatable when you were talking about artificial intelligence and what was the unique spark of consciousness interiorized to us as organic portals, right? As again, the, the bearers of the witness of life. There's a really important clarion call right now for us to make that consciousness leap. And I think that people in the past were reluctant to speak about such heady and outrageous subject matter about the intuitive and the psychic and the awareness that everything is wedded together as I spoke to earlier. And therefore information could be instantaneously accessible to us in any given moment. And not just some people, but that some people might have developed their faculties through extraordinarily difficult moments in their lives or trauma. And, and some people might've been born into this, but I believe that these are just facets, again, that have been cleared or clarified more and that everyone can work to open these faculties within them just by, at, at, as a first step, by turning their attention to it. And so I wanna hearken back to a very early part of childhood um, when I was seven years old and I had friends that were traveling across the planet and they were in London, England. And I was sitting with my mother and I looked at her and I said, Michael's grandfather just passed. And, and they were in north of London at the time. And my mother kind of went ghostly white and, and got her bearing. And I think she had had a, a memory of something like this happening before. And she scribbled down the information. And her godchildren were who we were speaking to, my close friends. And when they returned from England a few days later, they called us to notify us of the passing of their grandfather and my mother had intervened in the conversation. It was like, when did that happen? And the lineup was to the minute. And, and the point isn't here to be like self-aggrandizing, like, look what I can do. But rather, <laughs> I've heard from people in our profession, because we're empathic and sensitive and open, right, that we have this willingness to move 
in again the subtleties and and the the beauty and the elegance of energy medicine of vibratory medicine that these are talents that come up for many of us and i think that what happens is that in addition to our intellectual acumen and our ability to interpret and to analyze and to to be reductionist and to come to conclusions that there's a part of us that's just knowing and mm -hmm. so i'd like to transpose that childhood experience because there's been many more since then mostly meteorological and and geological for some reason um that when i've been working in this wondrous location of the Yanova Center and its many incarnations, I've noted that over time that even though as a professor of the medicine, as a scholar of the medicine, and as a humble instrument of the power behind the medicine in the architecture of the universe as a whole, that more often than not, my experience, my wisdom, my intelligence is superseded by this immediate awareness that when I come in with patients working through these dire, very poignant moments in their life of, of coming into procreation and conception, sustaining gestation to the birth of a healthy baby, right? Just to enumerate and, and stipulate all parts of that journey and the sorrow sometimes of when things might not go as planned, that there's a mm -hmm. strong intuitive imprint before anything happens with pulse, tongue, 10 questions and observation. And the more I recognize the multidimensionality of these experiences, the more powerful and, and clear and loud those intuitive um, inspirations, we should call them, come into being. And I have been emboldened and empowered by my friend, Dr. Joel Blakeway to move more into the realm of energy medicine. And we think, right, that this might sound like a flight of fancy. I, I don't think you and I do or the people listening do, but even places like the Monroe Institute in Fairfax, Virginia, that are studying the, the spaciousness and the capacity of human consciousness to project extra dimensionally, like that's become so prominent that even persons working within the Central Intelligence Agency have been working in tandem, right? Um, the, the gentleman McGonagall who's been working on the gateway voyage, which the CIA declassified, right? Like it's in the public record. It's not obscured. Nobody's obfuscating this. The time for us to understand the limitlessness, the mm -hmm. endless potential and the vast expanse and beyond of our consciousness and its ability to work, to co-create in communion with the physical vessel of this realm the time is now, it's going mm -hmm. to be brought forth and no better time than at this instant. So I thought that sharing the story from childhood and, and ensconcing it within the clinic today would help people understand that the resonance, right, of the archetypes of the realms that birth the realm in which we live are at work in the universe as a whole and in this medicine. And there's going to be many exciting talks at the symposium with Sabine Wilm um, and our beloved Zev Rosenberg about these subjects from the classics, from the ancient language. It's written into the ideograph, right? That there is a archetypal programming and that we are witnessing it and uncovering it. And when mm -hmm. we align with it and get into resonance with it, then the true power and beauty of the medicine is unleashed and is curated for the benefit of all. I love it. Uh, yes, 100%. It's almost as though we've come full circle. It, this, the theme of symposium, the uh, and underlying theme is return to the classics. And what you're discussing was discussed in the classics. I, for one, absolutely agree with everything you said. In fact, in February of this year, I spent a week with Joe McMonagle at the Monroe Institute and studied wow. under him. And it was amazing. I, I wasn't, 
Did you know that uh, Ram Das went through the Monero Institute, Carolyn Meese, Daniela Laporta, a lot of the thought leaders in the field, uh, Lynn McTaggart, they all went through Monroe Institute. I also want to mention a prominent Western physician, Dr. Zach Bush, would agree with absolutely everything you're saying at this moment. He was a Western trained physician who found the same information that you're revealing and uncovering, the oneness of it all, the universe, how we were created. And he shares many experiences like your seven-year-old experience that we're all connected, that we can, we're transhumanal, like we go past the the physical realms. And um, I, we this could be a whole other symposium. But um, wow, so much good stuff. I'm so excited for both of your talks, the morning lecture and the three hour deep dive in the afternoon. East, I just want to make a quick quip. Um, I'm so excited about how somewhere our higher selves outside of time or space moved all of this into, into per perfect synchrony that you had been to, to Fairfax, to the Monroe Institute and that at that time we talked about when I was seven, somebody gave me the book Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. I'm like, that's a rather tender age to be handed that text. And so I think there's some benevolent intelligence, you know, you know, the, the whole soul aggregate, as Rob, Robert Monroe would said, that have been steering us right to this moment. Thank you for your confirmation and your discussion of Zach Bush. Yeah. Yeah, all of this. It's just so fascinating. And so um, at Symposium, I know you're going to be there on Thursday. Are you staying through the weekend? So if people just want to come and, and say hi and talk a little bit further about some of this, will you be there the whole weekend? I, I would love that. I'm actually trying to, to stay for about six days. I, I always oh. like to come early and stay late, as they say. And um, <laughs> I, I feel like it's an important part for our global community. We've been you know, there's been an inhibition of us being able to dwell within one another's um, physical spaciousness. And so here it is, this this debut and, and return and sort of recapitulation. So it's an important moment for all of us that are connected that we so infrequently see one another. I have so many friends and colleagues and friends that I've yet to meet all over the planet. And I always found that the symposium was a stellar an unequaled opportunity for that global community to meet in such a beautiful location. So I'm excited for shared contemplation and reunions with people old and new. And, and that's my commitment to being there for the duration of the conference. So yes, I'm, I'm open and, and looking forward to meeting and communing with so many. Fabulous. I will be there. I actually, you're going to love this. I have a booth downstairs. Uh, a Dr. East booth, but that's not what I want to promote. At the booth, I have a possibility portal. Oh, I wow. literally am bringing the possibility portal because anything's possible in the 10,000 things. And so I am welcoming everybody, shoes off, of course, for respect, to step into the portal, state their intention to the universe, those are the cosmos, and I would love for you to come and step into my possibility portal at Symposium and possibly uh, not only your talks in Tel Aviv 2023, when are we thinking about publishing that book of yours that's in progress? Oh, well, it's my hope that that comes into being in 2024. I'm gonna spend the next uh, year ahead beginning to put that into some kind of greater scaffolding but I feel like I have a duty having been in this, again, this, this beautiful center of, of industry and thought, um, you know, situated at Pacific College for so many years, right? Having been in that building in, in the both, you know, both versions in Manhattan for over 20 years to, to record and to write and to give a, a sort of a portal or a perceptual window to how did everything develop here in this unique point in space and time. And, and I'm hoping that that allows the medicine to continue um, in a way that might be advantageous to anyone who would read it. I think that we've had a unique um, kaleidoscope of, of events and insights. And so I'm, I'm eager to write it all down. It yes, and I'm eager to, to read it. <laughs> yeah. I'm eager to read it. So step into 
that portal. Let's bring this thing into the material world so we can all get our hands on it or Audible or Kindle. But regardless, um, I'm sure there's, I'm not the only one that is eager to read what you write. Well, thank you so much for your kind words and your graciousness. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to speaking with you and seeing you again. And this has been such a great opportunity to, to warm up and to prepare and to preface and to really glean even more insights in how to make this a worthwhile experience. Thank oh, you. it's gonna be worthwhile. That is an understatement, my friend. So please come see Dr. Jeremy Pulsiver Thursday, November 3rd. I'll be there as well for the duration of the conference. Yes. We are kicking off a live in-person Pacific Symposium 2022, and we hope to see you there. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you again for the blessing of your presence, <laughs> My pleasure, my friend. I can't wait to see you. See you in a month. Bye. Bye for now.